when you feel that pull towards being really fearful and really getting into that hysteria, just stop and breathe, take a moment away, right? And then just come back and tell yourself, I'm doing the right things for my child and for my family. I know we're eating well. I know we're getting the most sleep that we can. We are trying to minimize our stress. We're trying to keep our immune systems boosted. And that is the best I can do. And I know it's going to help. Welcome back to the Essentially You podcast, all about reinventing your health with safer, cheaper, more effective natural solutions and powerful lifestyle changes so that you become the CEO of your health. I am your host, Dr. Marisa Snyder. Have you thought to yourself over the last two weeks or so, what exactly is this novel coronavirus and what should I do if I exhibit any symptoms? Now, the big question that many families have been wondering is, how much precaution should we take and is there cause for fear and concern? Now, I completely understand why many of us are feeling a bit fearful of this brand new virus and due to the request of many people to create an episode on it, I invited a dear friend of mine who is a pediatric medical doctor and coronavirus expert to shed light on the real facts surrounding this novel coronavirus and to provide recommendations for boosting you and your family's immune system. Now, I know that this topic is a little off course for my focus on women's health, but I have a feeling that you are looking for answers and that sometimes the news isn't the best place to feel reassured when you want to look out for you and your family. I know for me, I would prefer to talk to a fellow practitioner who knows exactly how to dig into the facts and the research and provide us with clarity and not hysteria. With that said, here are some key facts I want to quickly share with you before I bring her on. Now, we don't know yet how dangerous or contagious this new coronavirus is, and we won't know until more data comes in. Currently, research teams around the world are learning more and more about this virus every day. Now, COVID-19 is also known as the novel coronavirus, was first reported in Wuhan, China on December 31st, 2019, which started out as an outbreak, has since become an epidemic, and may set to become a pandemic with a virus in 57 countries as of today. COVID-19 is the name of the respiratory illness caused by the 2019 novel coronavirus that was first detected in Wuhan, China. Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that are named for the spikes on their surface that look like crowns. Corona in Latin means crown. As of February 29th, 2020, which is today, the day that we recorded this episode, 75% of worldwide COVID cases were still in China with a reported 79,394 cases. There were 70 cases in the U.S. with three new cases reported today. And there were a total number of a little over 6,000 cases outside of China with 1,300 new cases today. Now the mortality rate for the coronavirus is around 2% in the epicenter of the outbreak in China and less than 2% elsewhere. For comparison, seasonal flu typically has a mortality rate below 1% and is thought to cause about 400,000 deaths each year globally. SARS had a death rate of more than 10%. Just wanna give you a little bit of context. Now, I wanna dive into the symptoms and what we should be looking out for when it comes to COVID-19. Now, what is important to remember is that the majority of infected people appear to have very mild infections, with mild cold-like symptoms and fever, and many who do not exhibit any symptoms. There are absolutely cases right now of asymptomatic carriers in various countries. However, most people who contract the COVID-19 do seem to develop symptoms of some sort. So here are the reported symptoms as of today. Fever, uncomplicated upper respiratory system symptoms like cough, sore throat, nasal congestion, malaise, headache, muscle aches, very similar to the common cold, difficulty breathing, mild pneumonia, severe pneumonia, which can lead to severe acute respiratory infection, acute respiratory distress syndrome, sepsis and septic shock, and then death. Now death is of course what we are all worried about, so let's look more closely at what is going on. What is interesting to note is that children seem less vulnerable to infection and appear to have milder symptoms than adults. There have been no reported deaths in children zero to nine years of age. This is good news. However, we know that older adults seem to be more susceptible to a higher mortality rate. 
Although we're gonna dive much deeper into prevention, I just wanna note that the best way to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 is to avoid exposure. Now I get easier said than done, but this is why the CDC is recommending avoiding trips to places like China and South Korea and has new heightened travel warnings to areas with sustained community spread, right? There are definitely other areas that have higher spread in the, in the world, areas like Italy and Iran. Now, health officials also advise taking everyday steps that you can to prevent the spread of respiratory viruses. Wash your hands often with soap and water. Scrub for 20 to 30 seconds. Use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer when soap is not an option. Avoid touching your face in any way with unwashed hands and steer clear of sick people. And if you are sick, stay home and clean and disinfect frequently objects, surfaces, so that we are not moving this virus from one person to the next. Now, Dr. Elisa Song, who I am bringing on, is going to go much deeper into the facts surrounding this virus and how we can support our immune system. But before I bring Dr. Elisa Song on, I want to quickly take a moment and celebrate you. Despite our general concern for this virus, I just want to take a moment and honor your wins. Because every day I hear from new listeners who are recommended by you. One such listener is Virginia. She reached out to me on Instagram. And let me tell you, Instagram is my favorite place to meet you. I hope I get to meet you soon. Now, this is what Virginia had to say. This is exactly what I needed. I needed someone who was willing to not just recommend a pill, but to figure out what was going on with me. The detail of your episodes and the guests have helped me see what I can do and how I can figure out to support my immune system and my autoimmunity, my fatigue and anxiety. I have tools that are already making a big difference in my life. I cannot tell you how much this podcast has changed the way I think about my health and wellness. Well, thank you so much for sharing your epic win, Virginia. So happy to shout you out. And I am so glad that you are feeling more empowered and prepared to support your body with the recommendations that you hear on this show. Let me tell you, it is my number one goal. If you are listening, Virginia, I would love to gift you a signed copy of the EO Hormone Solution with a personal note from me. Just reach out to me on Instagram where you found me at Dr. Marisa and we will get it to you ASAP. Now, if you are listening, welcome to this episode. And if any interview or any solo for that matter, some of my podcast episodes have helped you in any way, I would love to shout you out. You can reach out to me via Instagram, Facebook, or the gold standard. Simply review this podcast on iTunes or whatever podcast platform you plug into. That way, together, we are changing the way women think about their bodies and empowering them with the knowledge to become the CEO of their health. Now let's jump into this crucial conversation with Dr. Elisa Song, but before I bring her on, I want to quickly sing her praises. Holistic Mama Doctor, Dr. Elisa Song is a holistic pediatrician, pediatric functional medicine expert, and a mama of two crazy fun kids. In her integrative pediatric practice, Whole Family Wellness, she helps thousands of kids get to the root cause of their health concerns and helps their parents understand how to help their children thrive by integrating conventional pediatrics with functional medicine, homeopathy, acupuncture, herbal medicine, and essential oils. She helps kids with all kinds of concerns from frequent colds, ear infections, asthma, to things like anxiety, depression, and autoimmune conditions. Now, Dr. Song created her website, Healthy Kids, Happy Kids, to share her advice and adventures as a holistic pediatrician and mama. Now everyone can have their very own virtual holistic pediatrician at their fingertips by heading to her website, healthykidshappykids.com. Let's bring Dr. Song onto the show. Welcome to the Essentially You podcast, Dr. Elisa Song. How are you doing today? I am awesome, and I'm super excited to spend this beautiful Sunday afternoon with you. <laughs> oh my goodness, look at we, we are podcasting on the weekend. <laughs> That's right. That That's is right. how much we love what we do. Mm-hmm. 
And you are actually at a conference right now. You are playing I hooky. I am. I am. I'm playing hooky. I spoke this morning, so I have an excuse, right? I just, I need, this is, I need, this is your I need treat yourself. This is you hanging <laughs> right. out with me. Uh huh. <laughs> you are my go to definitive expert when it comes to boosting the immune system, keeping families healthy. And right now, you are, you are one of the definitive experts in bulldogs for research when it comes to infections and maybe even infectious conditions that happen within families. We're talking about the coronavirus. As you know, and I know people are up in arms about what to do. What is this? What should we be doing? And when I read your blog that you just put out a couple days ago, I, I by no means was I surprised at the thoroughness, the research, the background and everything that went into this. But we're going to be talking about what what we should be worried about and what we should not be worried about today. That's right. That's right. I think it's really important because you cannot pick up the paper. You can't turn on the TV. You can't listen to your radio without pretty much every other word coming out of the announcer's mouth. Coronavirus, right? And coronavirus fear has taken the world by storm. And I am not going to say that we should take this lightly. We need to take this seriously, but we need to separate out the facts and the fear. And that's exactly what I want to do with my blog post. It's super long. I mean, you know, right? They say no more than 2,000 words. I think this is like six or 7,000 words. Girl, it's I a don't book. Know. It could easily book. be like a, a mini book. book. But, I, but. You know, I did this research because so. I'm a pediatrician, right? I'm getting tons and tons of calls. And so I said, okay, I need to do this research for my patients. But I also really, really importantly, I'm a mom and I need to do this research for my family because if it comes, when it comes, it's already here in the States. What can I do to keep Kenzie and Bodie healthy and strong and my family so that we can sail through because we know, right? I'm going to just start off right off the bat. We know that the majority of people do seem like they have mild infection. So I am not going to say that we should take the death slightly at all. There are way too many people dying from coronavirus right now, but the vast majority of people who get coronavirus are not going to die. So that's why I really want people to feel um, more empowered to know that there are actually things that I, I believe as a pediatrician with all the research that I did that we can do to keep our immune system strong and really, really significantly reduce the likelihood that we'll have any complications. Hmm. And I just love, I guess like I said, the thoroughness that you've come into, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of this. And I want to just speak, just have you take a little moment. I know people are like, just get in it. But I want to have you take a little moment. You are not, not only a holistic pediatrician, you are a functional medicine expert. And that's why you're at this event right now, because you are speaking on a topic for, for other practitioners, because you you come from the lens of functional medicine. And I know because of that, that you get incredible results. I know that you have a, you know, massively booked out practice. So tell me a little bit about what was the driver for you to want to go into this work? You know, the biggest driver, and I I think this is really a commonality for a lot of functional medicine practitioners, but the biggest driver for me was that when I came out of residency, I just, I was shocked at the number of sick, sick kids that I was seeing. Right, the number of kids when I finished my residency in 2000, right? I'm I'm dating myself, right? I've been doing this for 20 years now. But when I graduated residency, I was told that if I saw a handful of kids with autism in my lifetime, that would be a lot. Right? I mean, fast forward, I opened my practice and my practice was flooded with kids with autism and parents who were seeking answers, right? Root cause answers for how to heal their kids. And then the autoimmunity. I mean, today I I just lectured on pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with strep and PANS. So PANS, PANDAS, which is an autoimmune encephalitis that more and more kids have, right? If your kids have anxiety, OCD, ODD, ADD, I mean, look, they may have infection. And so I was seeing more and more kids with autoimmune diseases too, right? I mean, people who have heard me speak, they know that I talk about my, one of my youngest patients I thought I had with autoimmune disease was an 18 month old with ulcerative colitis. But unfortunately that prize actually took, that prize went to my six month old who was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, right? We, our kids are not thriving, not thriving at all. And the way we're going with conventional medicine and conventional life and our standard American diet needs to stop. And so that was one of my 
biggest motivations to see what is going on. How can I either keep kids from being put on medications from the time they're three, so then they're on them for lifelong, or hopefully get them off of their medications in a way that really gets them healthier and keeps them you know, really thriving from the inside out. And then, of course, when I have my own kids, even more, right? Because I want to know, well, how do I prevent this epidemic of autoimmunity and chronic illnesses from really hitting my kids? So that's where, you know, it's, fu- it's functional medicine. We have so many different tools in our toolkit. So it's not just functional medicine. We have to look at acupuncture. I practice acupuncture, herbal medicine, of course, use essential oils. And as the essential oils expert that you are, I mean, you've taught me so much. And, and I tell all my mamas about your books to get, right? And I know you're coming out with a new one, so I can't wait to share. So really, really important, really important that we understand that conventional medicine has a time and a place mostly it's for acute trauma, right? Trauma and, you know, intensive care treatments. It's not for chronic diseases. Now with coronavirus, you know, there could be a role for conventional medicine. Unfortunately, we don't know. We have no idea what medications, pharmaceuticals will work against coronavirus. There's research going on and I hope that research, uh, the, the findings come out soon. And researchers are around the world trying to find a pharmaceutical agent and a vaccine that will work against coronavirus. We don't have it yet though, right? There's nothing conventional that we know that will kill coronavirus. And that I think is what is really help, uh, making people even more fearful. And that's probably not even, you know, it's going to be months to over a year for anything like that to come out, especially a vaccine. So in the meantime, what I wrote this article about was really, what do we know about coronavirus? What do we know about this particular coronavirus. Right. Novel, this isn't the only kind of coronavirus right, out there. That's right. Mm-hmm. So we're going to, and we're going to get into that. I just want to say, I just want to take a moment and say, thank you. You know, being an integrative MD as yourself to see the ways in which you are helping parents get to the root cause. And I know as we're listening to this, the idea of a six month old having Crohn's disease, when we think of Crohn's disease as someone in their forties or in their fifties or colitis, you know, I had a family member at the age of 59 who had a colitis episode a couple, couple months ago. We don't think about babies having that. We don't think about children having all of these types of chronic conditions. When you and I were growing up, this just wasn't happening. And it parents deserve a, a root cause answer. And I just want to, I just know as a pioneer in the work that you do, I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Oh, thank you, Marisa. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I am so lucky to know people like you who have such an amazing voice in the natural health community and can really share all this information. Yeah, absolutely. All right, girl, let's get in it. So let's you do it. you got the article out. Uh, we're going to, don't worry, you guys, we will link the article to this episode. Now in this article, a big part of it was that you wanted to help parents and practitioners. Let's be honest, practitioners, researchers, everyone's in the dark. It's like you had said earlier, but you wanted to offer ways in which we could have facts about what's going on, this pan- pot- potential pandemic or really pandemic without fear. So talk about how you were, what you were doing in, in relaying that with the article. Yeah, well, I always tell my patients and the mamas and the practitioners who follow me that knowledge is power. And in this case, we don't have a lot of knowledge. So that's where when I start to get nervous about something or anxious about something, I really try to dig into the research. And, you know, whatever research we have, and we need to think outside the box because we don't have a lot of research on this novel coronavirus, but we do have research on other coronaviruses that we could maybe apply to this this pandemic, you know, that's really about to hit. And so, you know, one of the things that I like to do is dig into the research, think outside the box, look at any uh, conventional and natural treatments and kind of put all the pieces together for families in a way that's easy to understand. Because I think when we have knowledge, we can really approach this upcoming, you know, pandemic across the world, right? That's the definition of of pandemic, but really approach this a little bit more calmly and a little bit more rationally. I'm not going to say that there's not going to be fear. I have my moments of being really worried about it, right? But one thing that I really love that the World Health Organization's uh, Director General, Dr. I'm going to really, I hope I say his name right, but Dr. Tedros Adhanom uh, Ghebreyesus, what he said at a meeting on February 15, 2020, was that we're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. This is a time for facts, not fear. This is a time for rationality, not rumors. So I I urge everyone, really, there's so much information flying around the web, 
both conventionally and from, you know, quote, alternative healthcare practitioners, look into the research and really try to glean the most rational information that you can. And it's challenging, right? It's challenging. I mean, there's a lot of fear mongering out there too, and people don't know what to believe. So I really wanted this to be um, a very comprehensive look at COVID-19, which is what they're calling the respiratory illness right now that's being caused by the new coronavirus and get as much information out there as possible. I think that if we have information and facts that we can really sit, really calm a lot of fears. Mm, I agree. So let's get into a couple of those facts. I know the question people are wondering, and we talked a little bit about the coronavirus, but what exactly is this coronavirus and how, how would you and I or our families get it? Yes. So as you mentioned before, right, there are many, many, many coronaviruses, many. Like the common cold. That's right. And they can range in symptoms from, you know, they're like many, many different coronaviruses that literally just give you a cold, right? But then there are the more severe coronaviruses that caused things in the past, like SARS, a lot of us remember SARS from years back and, and really how afraid the world became. And that didn't really end up to be as tragic as we had thought it would be. But then there is a Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, MERS, that, that also really hit and was another kind of coronavirus. Both of these were transmitted by animals. And then we get to this coronavirus, right, the novel 2019 coronavirus, uh, and that also was thought to have originated from some of the animal markets in Wuhan, China. You'll see a couple of different names. So you'll see it called the novel, 2019 novel coronavirus. It's also called the 2019-NCOV, so the novel coronavirus there. Or you're also going to see it called sars Dash COV dash two. That is all the same virus. It's all the same virus. So what is COVID nineteen? Because a lot of people are see COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen is not the name of the virus. It's the name of the respiratory illness that this new coronavirus is causing. So how would we get it? Right, like the common cold. Right. Think about how you might get the common cold in the beginning. You know, back when corona when this new coronavirus was just being described in China. It was thought that it was really just through animal transmission. And the recommendation was to only eat really cooked cooked animal products um, and avoid contact with non-domesticated animals. But now it is abundantly clear that human-to-human transmission is happening. And it's happening through mostly through respiratory droplets. So what does that mean? When you sneeze, when you cough, these droplets that you're spewing from your mouth or your nose. That right? you don't even know you're doing. That I you mean, don't even know, right? I mean, <laughs> Oh, we've that, seen it. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That contains the virus that then can be transmitted to you, right? And it can enter you through your eyes, through your nose, through your mouth, right? And so really, um, we want to make sure that when we are exposed, and then this is just for anyone who's coughing or sneezing, You want to keep your distance, right? You know, really what the CDC considers close contact that would put you at risk for contracting this new coronavirus is really a six feet distance. Now, you know, we all in in the kids school, we talk about your personal bubble, right? Don't invade (laughs) someone else's bubble, right? So I, I think we should think of it that way, right? If you have a person who's sick and if you're sick yourself, just Tell people, hey, why don't you stay away? Let's stay out of my bubble because I don't want to get you sick, right? And if you're sick, please do the same, right? So trying to stay away from people who obviously are sick. Now, there is, there also has been found some coronavirus in fecal matter, so in stool. So uh, we don't know, you know, if that's a possible transmission source, but it is interesting that they found the virus um, in fecal samples. And the other thing that's under investigation is what we call fomites surfaces, right? Like, could you, if someone has coronavirus and they sneeze onto, let's say their hand and touch a doorknob, and then you touch the doorknob later, could that virus be transmitted from the doorknob? And then you touch your face and get it. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. So that that's under investigation, but for now, wipe surfaces, right? Use your, you know, wipe your surfaces down with whatever favorite, I would say, use a more natural disinfectant. We have a spray that we spray all the, like the airplane little area down That's and right. everything. Oh, and I, yeah. Yeah. So just, you know, <laughs> making sure. And I mean, you go to the store, you know, you just kind of little wipes we have. But we, my husband the other day, 
um, Alex was like, okay, where's, where's the sprays? Where, you know, and then we were sending the sprays to friends and family just I in know, case, I know. just because, you know, just to be careful. And I am curious, I know that other viruses, cold and flu virus, coronaviruses can stay on fomites, yes. can stay on laptops and door handles and yeah, um, inside the bathroom and, you know, mm-hmm. for, you know, two hours or three hours or whatever that time yeah. frame I mean, is some before viruses, they die. I believe, I mean, and I'm, I can't remember which viruses, but there are some viruses that can live even for days on surfaces. So we just have to be, be exercise caution. You don't have to, you know, be totally crazy about it. But I know for me, when I travel, you know, tomorrow I'm getting on a plane to go back to San Francisco and I for sure am going to be, now I also have a separate blog post on how to have a healthy holiday. This is really centered around healthy traveling, but when they've tested different areas in the airport and airplanes for germs, right? The germiest, germiest place is, I mean, you'd think the, the bathroom flush, but no, it's actually <laughs> so gross. But you know, the, the button on the, the water fountain is actually the, one of the dirtiest places. Now we have the fill station, so you don't have to touch a button, right? And, and of course, your laptop, the tray top table, right? I mean, I have seen people change their baby's diapers on laptop uh, tray tables. So uh, you, just, yeah. Yeah. So absolutely they do. So, so I, you know, the belt buckle. Get you know, it where the, you the fit in. Button. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's so uh, yeah. So that's what that's what I'm gonna be doing tomorrow for sure. Alisa, do you know if people knew if we knew family was immune system compromised, just thinking maybe a grandparent or an older parent, would you be mindful about maybe canceling flights for them at the moment, you know, it just depending on if if there are more immune system compromised, like I had dear friends of mine who had a trip planned to Asia, they had like a, a six week trip planned, they were supposed to leave a week ago, and they just decided to cancel it, to play it safe. And we are actually we're going to Italy in May. And goodness, you know, Italy's having Italy's working it out right now. Um, and we have not canceled that flight, but it's just something, you know, and I don't anticipate we're going to either. Are these things that we should be considering? You know, that's such a great, great question. And I get asked that. And it's, it's so hard because right now, apart from travel to these countries where we are seeing some spikes like South Korea and Italy, and there are a couple of other countries that are on watches, right? Iran, uh, Japan, right? And of course, China, you know, I would not travel to right now, but some of these other countries where there are some travel alerts right now, they're either level two or level one. I would exercise caution. I think that if you do have immune compromise or you have a chronic health condition and you're not well, right? Because, you know, if you have a chronic health condition and you're in a really good state of health and you're taking care of your body, then you're probably okay. But if, if you're not, if you are, if you would consider yourself not in good health, Right, I would exercise caution, and you know we're we're kind of stuck. My mother, she's surviving from her esophageal cancer, and over the summer, we we have been really excited to do a daughter's mother trip. On her bucket list is going on an Alaska cruise, right? And so we were all ready to book it, and then this happened. We're like, wow, you know, we're gonna wait. We're gonna wait to book it especially a cruise, because, you know, as the CDC says, you know, if you travel uh, to an area that then becomes endemic with the novel coronavirus, you may need to be quarantined, right? Or if you aren't, I hope they don't, you know, the the whole debacle with the Diamond Princess is not going to be repeated, but um, you just have to be prepared if you travel that you may be quarantined. Now, that being said, that gets to, well, who would be okay traveling? And you kind of alluded to that, right? Because really who gets symptoms and what are the symptoms? Because the symptoms, even with this novel coronavirus, again, it seems that most people are getting mild symptoms. Mild. Yes. Let's emphasize that. Like especially children and pregnant women. That's right. That's right. Which is totally different than the flu, right? Because the flu tends to hit young kids. It can hit pregnant women and the elderly the hardest. But for most people, even children and pregnant women, they might get a fever and what looks like a cold or a cough. So you're not going to be able to distinguish whether or not you have a cold or maybe you might have influenza, right? But then uh, some people will go on to develop more severe pneumonia and lower respiratory illness, difficulty breathing, and then go on to have acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is what we saw in SARS, um, and develop sepsis and even die. And that's the scary part. 
But we do know some evidence now from China, right? China has a large, very large, unfortunate number right now. But we know that the people who are dying in China are almost all the elderly. So over 80 is its own risk factor, even over 70. But, you know, really under about 40, the the mortality rate is really, really low. It's like less than a percentage. That's right. A less Mm -hmm. than a percentage. And there have been no reported deaths in children under nine and none that I know of in pregnant women. Now I will say, so today, as we record this, it's February 29. And I've been putting updates on my blog post. I wrote it. I mean, literally I wrote it three days ago and it's been just spreading like crazy. And it's I've spreading even- like its own virus. <laughs> just <laughs> right. kidding. But like it's yeah. gotten, I mean, clearly, you know, it's very obvious that the, the thoroughness and the scientific backing of this article people are getting their hands on it. So I'm really excited to share it. And I'm grateful that you're updating it because I know that we're learning things every day. We're we're getting more insight. We are. And I'm updating the numbers, right? The number uh, of cases around the world. And of course, just this past weekend, not too long ago, we had our first case in California, um, pretty close to me, Solano County, right? Of no known exposure, no known exposure to anyone else with the novel coronavirus no history of travel. So we're getting these cases that we don't know where they're getting it from. So obviously it's in the community, but obviously we, we're not having so many numbers that are going to the ERs and needing treatment and needing hospitalization. So I do think that there are, we don't know how many people are asymptomatic carriers. I was going to say, have uh, there have been people that are as, potentially asymptomatic. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, when they looked at this one study of kids, there were two babies under 12 months of age who had coronavirus. And the only reason they were tested was because there were family members who were symptomatic and they had it in their nose, but didn't have symptoms, right? These are babies, right? So when we think about then, okay, who are those people who are more at risk for complications and for mortality? That age seems to be the number one factor, right? And we can't look, I want to remind people, we can't look at the number of deaths in China and extrapolate that to the rest of the world and to the US. The mortality rate is significantly higher in China than what we're seeing around the world. And, you know, because China is being crushed right now with the number of cases. They don't have enough supplies. They don't have enough doctors. They don't have enough ICU beds. They don't have enough anything right now. And they're in this situation where they have more and more people who are sick and not enough ways to help them. So the numbers are expected to be much lower in terms of mortality, in terms of death rate in other countries. Now you can get tested for the coronavirus. How, how would one go about that? I know that basically we can do swabs. Is that correct? Yes. So you can get tested. How easy, How easy is it, it is. Yes. Like, it's a whole is, different ballgame. <laughs> there is a test. There's a DNA test for the novel coronavirus. Now this test is not available at the moment as we speak on February 29th to local doctor's offices and local emergency departments. So if you came to me and you, you had just traveled from Italy with your child and you have a, a you know, fever and a cough, I could not test you. I would have to refer you to the public health department where they would send you to a place to be tested. And it's a nasal swab and also an an oropharyngeal swab, so a mouth swab. Now, one of the recommendations from the CDC, which I think is a really wise one, is do not rush to your doctor's office or to the ER just to get tested, right? If your child had a cold, right? Let's take coronavirus out of the picture. If your child had a cold, or even if they had a fever with a cough, most parents are not rushing to the doctor on day one. Most parents are waiting and kind of watching and doing what they can at home. So take that same practice with you when it comes to your child's illness and your illness right now. Because what we're finding from China is very likely the spread has been so rapid because people are lining up in the hospitals to get tested. In the meantime, if you don't have coronavirus in that crowded waiting room and hallway, you will likely be exposed to someone with coronavirus and get it if you didn't already have it, right? Or or you can give it to someone else even if they didn't have it. So we just want to exercise caution. You know, when I work with families and when I work with my online mamas and practitioners, I teach them how to use homeopathy, essential oils, herbs, you know, diet and lifestyle, acupressure points for their most common acute 
symptoms like fevers, coughs, colds, so that you can have the tools, right? I love natural medicines in that way because you can have the tools to nip that illness in the bud. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if your child has coronavirus, if it's COVID-19, if it's a mild COVID-19 and you can manage it at home. So I would say if you have, if you or your child are sick, but don't need medical care, don't go to the doctors, right? Yeah, I was I was at the hospital a couple of weeks about three or four weeks ago and we had to go to we had to go to urgent care and I would say ninety-five percent of who was in urgent care most likely had the flu. And that's just what it was, you know, and I know that a lot of urgent care facilities, ER facilities have been to the stack to the gills with with influenza patients. And goodness knows, I know that whoever didn't have a cold or a flu in that in that space probably got exposed. And so the intention here with this coronavirus, clearly there's a couple of gray areas like, wait, someone may be asymptomatic or somebody's symptoms are mild and goodness knows people are still getting colds and flus as we speak right now. And so it can look very similar to that until it kind of upgrades to something a little bit more serious. Ideally, it's not the time to flood the hospitals with, you don't know, with kind of a hunch of what might be going on. That's right. That's right. And really and truly, if you are one of those people who has mild coronavirus illness, we actually do, it is helpful to know. And now the CDC may may expand their testing criteria because we want to know mostly because we don't want you to spread it to other people, right? We're trying to contain it so that it's not spread to people who are more at risk for serious illness and even death from, from the new coronavirus. Hmm. Let's talk about the immune system. Let's talk about a functional approach because at the end of the day, we can prepare our immune system Real, I mean, you know, there's no, there's no guarantee, but we know that if we can bolster the immune system, we really have a, a great chance. And the, you know, the reason why I ended up getting into natural remedies for boosting the immune system is I don't know if I ever told you, Lisa, but I used to get sick seven to 11 times a year with colds and flus. There's a lot of things I tried, a lot of things that wouldn't work, you know, and not the things that they, they helped a little bit, but I got into some really incredible, you know, natural remedies that I went from getting sick seven to 11 times a year. And it felt like I was just a circulating host for all of these, probably Corona, you know, it's little common cold, little flus. And so I started using some natural solutions we're going to be talking about in just a moment and in the form of essential oils, herbs, homeopathies. I mean, we're, I was doing all of it. And I was able to, I, I didn't get sick for three and a half years. And it really was about highly supporting my immune system so that it was, it wasn't like I wasn't exposed to viruses in those three and a half years. I was exposed to all kinds of stuff in those three and a half years. It's just that my immune system was more prepared than it had been before. That's right. That's right. So I think really one of the best ways to protect ourselves and our kids is really looking at keeping our immune systems as strong as possible so that if we do get not just the new coronavirus, but maybe influenza or maybe right. any oh, number of thousands yes. of germs or strep, that are circulating, or, yeah. Yeah, that, that we are the ones who have mild illness or maybe no signs of illness. I do want to say that, you know, there, in terms of, quote, treating COVID-19, there is no known treatment. I just want to reiterate that. There is no known pharmaceutical or natural treatment that we know currently that is effective against the novel coronavirus. So what I did in the blog is really look at the research and see what other agents, natural agents, have seemed to be effective against past coronavirus strains and really different natural agents that can really help in the literature to resolve and heal sepsis, right? Because sepsis is what most people with coronavirus die from. Now, before we even get to that, let's talk about how do we not get to that point? And so boosting your immune system, as you said, is the number one way to do that. Now, boosting your immune system, I would say the two things, I mean, there's so many things, right? But the, the two things, well, I guess it's not just two, but number one, number one, you got to get off that sugar, right? You got to really lower your sugar intake. Refined sugar has been found to reduce the activity of natural killer cells 
and macrophages. The, those are the kind of white blood cells that literally eat viruses and the bacteria. Like literally eat. Literally eat. Literally. <laughs> Phage means to eat yes, in to Latin. Eat. Right? <laughs> so, so they eat, right? The, the viruses. So sugar affects negatively our macrophages ability to do that. And the effects can last up to five hours after eating a sugary food. So then you think about, I mean, just think about kids' birthday parties, right? Where there are not just the pizza, but there is the cake and the cupcakes and the Skittles and the, you know, whatever, the, you know, ice cream and all that other sugar. Do you ever wonder why then the very next day your kid has a fever and they're sick, right? Girl, so, yes. Goodness. I was just a little con- full confession. We were invited to a party. Um, we didn't know it was a kid's party. Um, so we show up and there's kids everywhere, which is wonderful. Um, and they've got gluten-free cupcakes and things. And Alex kind of gets into the cupcakes. Um, and he went to the bathroom before we left. And I don't know how many children in that house had hand, foot, and mouth, oh but Alex got it. Oh, and this was guy. back in September. Oh my goodness. Oh. It was like full tilt. That's I was like, right. oh my gosh, what is yes. going on? Yes. And, yes, and adults doctors were like, wait, are you, <laughs> like, were you around children? And we're like, oh, we were at this birthday party for like yep. two hours yep. Yep. and <laughs> you know, candy and ice cream, all of it. And I kids. Know. And, and it's, it's amazing how fast that can happen. Totally. That's right. Um, so reduce your sugars. The next thing is really, really ramping up your antioxidant status, right? All the colorful fruits and vegetables. And I mean, as many colors as you can, because each color represents a different antioxidant and a different phytonutrient. Now, why is that so important? Because what we found in sepsis, many people by this point have heard of the cytokine storm. Right? The cytokine storm is basically your immune system after some infection or insult just going haywire and out of control, which is, which is what we see in sepsis. And they found that IV vitamin C, right, maybe other antioxidants like quercetin can reduce that cytokine storm and help heal people when they have sepsis. So they've also found that people who have enough vitamin C and enough vitamin D in their system. I was going to say vitamin D. Vitamin D. Speak to me on that. Maybe at less risk for developing sepsis. Vitamin D, you know, taking a vitamin D supplement, because there are some supplements to boost your immune system. Vitamin D is number one. Number one. Number one. Number one. It is the supplement that I am the most religious about giving my kids and my fam- myself and my husband over the winter time, or really any time, you know, even in the middle of summer, when kids are running around outside, getting sun all day long, swimming outside, they still, I'll check their vitamin D levels. And almost every single one of them is either outright deficient or insufficient. Or right below. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so, so true. And I think people think vitamin C, vitamin C, vitamin C. Can we say no orange juice? Cause that's sugar. No, no right? orange juice. That's vitamin right. C, but we don't ever think people don't realize that vitamin D is a major player in boosting our immune cells. And in order for our immune cells to actually fight the fight for us, we have to have enough vitamin D to run those reactions. So true. And in this day and age, we have so many other forces on our immune system that stress us out that our vitamin D levels just get depleted unless most of us are taking a vitamin D supplement. So vitamin D has this, it makes this incredible little protein called cathelicidin that has amazing antiviral properties and antibacterial properties and has been known to reduce your risk of sepsis. So hands down vitamin D. Talk Um, to me about stress, Elisa. Should we be mindful about stress? Because I feel like that was the reason why I got sick so much. Yep. Yep. Stress for sure, right? When we're stressed and when when we release our stress hormones, so cortisol and adrenaline, that alone stresses our immune system, suppresses our immune system, suppresses our ability to fight infections, right? Now, adrenaline, we might be running on adrenaline temporarily, right? Because adrenaline actually will halt sort of that immune fighting for a while, right? Which is why a lot of people, when they're on adrenaline, got a project to do, a lot of stress going on. They're not sick, but they crash, right? As soon as it's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I used to always go, 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 go to a project or whatever it was. And then on the other side of it, that is when I felt like my immune system was like, oh, we, we can't, we're done. That's right. So stress alone lowers our white blood cells ability to deal with infections, just like sugar. 
So stress management is really important. And that's one of the hardest things for people, right? Because I mean, changing diet is hard enough. But then telling people you got to slow down and you really have to get your exercise and meditate and be mindful, especially for a kid, that can be challenging to do. So I give people easy tools, right? And actually, I should list that here. I wrote a whole blog on on stress, back to school, back to stress, and also mindfulness for kids. But we want to make this doable and uh, easy, right? Yes. I just wanted to kind of put that out there. I know you've got other remedies, but it's just one of those things to be thinking about. Like, how do we not panic and freak out. That's right. You know, that could lend totally. to more issues. That, well, and so that to your point, right, this fear around coronavirus, right, this fear that's in a way, you know, if you get tested and you're not symptomatic and you have it, I mean, the fear alone can cause inflammation that, that, that then could drive you to get sicker. So it really it is very important to remain calm during this, this, what I would say is really a crisis in the news, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So we have, we've got healthy food. We've got take down the sugar. We've got vitamin D, vitamin C. Anything else you recommending um, that people can, I mean, well, clearly wash sleep, your hands. Right. Wa- sleep. Well, sleep is really key, right? Cause we kind of repair and restore in our sleep. We also want to make sure that we, um, I mean, if you can fermented foods, kimchi has been found to kill the H1N1 flu virus. So it hasn't been tested against this coronavirus, but I mean, kimchi and fermented foods are awesome. And then, like you said, the common sense measures, right? We have to make sure our kids are washing their hands, right? 20 to 30 seconds. Washing hands with soap and water has actually been found to be more effective than antibacterial spray at killing influenza virus. We don't know about coronavirus, but still washing hands when you can. Keeping your hands away from eyes, mouth, and nose, because that's where coronavirus can enter. Now, if you sit and think about, I, you know, I just paid attention today to how many times I touch my face and I, t- I touch my eyes, right? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I don't bite my fingernails. I used to, but really we touch our faces a lot, right? And then you have kids who are like sucking on their hand or like putting their fingers in their mouth. So just pay attention, notice when you're doing it. So then you can pay attention to not doing it, right? Oh, the last thing, what I think is really, really crucial because most viruses, the way they work is they'll, someone sneezes, coughs, you get it in your nostrils, right? In your nasal pastures and the virus starts to multiply. And maybe you have a day or two or longer before you actually start to feel sick. Yes. So latency you, period. Talk to right. me about that. That's yeah. right. So if you can irrigate, do a nasal saline spray, blow your nose, neti pot, clear out that virus before it starts to colonize and take hold, I really do think that can go a long way in minimizing your risk for getting getting the infection. Now, uh, latency, right? The incubation period. You know, most people will develop symptoms within days. Within four days, give or take. Like median number, I think is four days at the moment. Four days, yeah. So most people, but some people can last like up to like eleven. More than that, more than that. Uh, yeah, 14 days. And there was one, one case reported, maybe even 19. Nine, that's right. I remember. Okay. It could be long, but for the most part, it's pretty short. It's not as short. Like the common cold is usually a day, right? The common cold moves fast. That is a, that is a fast colonizing <laughs> that's right, virus. That's right. um, but this one, yeah, it's probably going to be about three or four days. So when it comes to using some type of irrigation system, neti pot, if let's just say, you know, as a precaution, because a lot of us have neti pots, a lot of us have nasal sprays that we can use. Let's say we know that we were, we were next to somebody who was coughing or sneezing. And I mean, let's be honest, that's how all respiratory viruses bind. They're all going to bind within our nasal passage. So in case you guys were wondering how that all happens, (laughs) yeah, don't touch your nose. Um, But those little viruses, they go into the little nasal passage and they lock on. And then they start to multiply. It's ultimately what they're doing. And so if you're surrounded by someone who is coughing and you don't, you know, you're like, you just don't want to get sick no matter what it is. The, the recommendation is to try to, is to ir- pretty much irrigate pretty quickly so that you're, you're moving that virus out or as many of them as possible. That's right. I will tell you, I have my saline nasal spray. I use one called X clear, but it's on my bathroom stand right now. I mean, these conferences, right? There's hundreds of people. So the second I get in, I hundreds, of I, okay, hundreds of doctors. Hundreds of doctors. That's right. That are, that are probably the germiest people in the world. <laughs> so I irrigate my nose immediately. Tomorrow when I fly, as soon as I get off the plane, I'm going to irrigate my nose, right? I love that so, as a yeah, precaution. So really, really important. 
Wash your hands, wash your nose. Those are going to be the big takeaways here. I know we talked a little bit about precautions for travel as well. Anything else, Elisa, that we should be mindful of? You know, I know that I know that the the internet, I know that the news is going to keep on freaking us out. Yes. And so, yes, any kind of the job of the media. Yeah, that is the job of the media. (laughs) Absolutely. What I've been doing is really looking at, um, so the World Health Organization, they have some really good information. I actually think that they have more useful information than the CDC. They have some um, some videos now. They're really trying to do a lot more education through graphics and videos. So uh, they have some good, like, what is coronavirus videos on their website. I've been looking, right, mostly to update this blog now, but looking at their situation reports, they're called, because every single day they report on new cases around the world. So what they'll do is report the total number of cases in every single country around the world. And then in parentheses, they put how many new cases that day. So you can just keep track. Like if you're traveling somewhere, you can just take a look and see, well, are are we really seeing a rapid increase in perhaps those countries I might consider maybe holding off on travel. I liked that advice in terms of travel. Like if, as long as you aren't, clearly there are some countries that we should probably just kind of keep our distance from at the moment. And that makes so much sense. But if you're, you know, you're trying to get from California to Arizona or vice versa, or, you know, wherever the, whatever that may be. I mean, right now we, we're leaving for Arizona next week where I'm not canceling my flight for that event. I'm not that concerned about it, but we're going to have our little sprays and we're going to take our, our vitamin C and our vitamin D with us. And we're just going to be, we're going to be really great about washing our hands. Yeah. Yep. I'm not trying to ever get sick on a plane. That's right. Ever. That's right. Well, so I'm, I'm really glad you said that because, you know, one thing that I want parents to take away from at the moment right now, and probably ongoing into the future, if your child or you have a cold or a fever or a cough, chances are it is not coronavirus. It is much more likely to be the flu or some other common cold virus. So with that being said, right, yes, we don't know what can be effective right now in terms of natural treatments against the new coronavirus, but we certainly have a lot under our tool belt for influenza and for the common cold. And that's where you use your homeopathy. You take your oscillococcinum, you, know, you use your essential oils, you take elderberry syrup. And you know, I have a whole kind of natural medicines toolkit that I, I travel with, right? When we travel, it's for my family and for me. Um, and, and you know, if you have it, you're not going to use it, right? So take it with you. But there's so many things that can actually be really, really helpful. And we know, I know from evidence, right, from the research and also evidence from my clinical practice. Because evidence-based medicine, right? A lot of people like to throw out evidence-based medicine, but evidence-based medicine, the definition doesn't just include research papers. It includes clinical experience, right? And so I know from my practice, a lot of these natural remedies that are amazing, that if you can start in the beginning of, of any illness, you can really nip that illness in the bud pretty quickly. Absolutely. And we, we don't, we don't get sick. I mean, honestly, Alex hadn't been sick in almost three years until he ran into the hand, foot and mouth virus back in September. But we are so diligent about having our elderberry flower. We, we also travel with nasal sprays. Clearly we travel with essential oils. <laughs> we travel, you know, we, we travel with a lot of vitamins, a lot of antioxidants. We're really mindful when you travel a lot, and I know people who are listening to this right now, you guys are listening and you do probably, some of you are absolutely are traveling a lot. And it's just important to, you know, prepare for wherever you're going. So for us, we always have a number of options because we do know that it's not, it's not always easy to get your, get your hands on those options when you're out and about when you're at a conference or you're at a work thing, you might as well just have it with you, especially during the seasons where we see more environmental threats in the environment and circulating air in an airplane. That's right. You should have called me when Alex had hand foot and mouth. That's what a pediatrician deals with. <laughs> I, should, I mean, we just, you're absolutely, you know, it took us a couple of days to figure it out because <laughs> I had, I mean, I learned it in school. I saw it in school, you know, once and then I hadn't, I have never seen it. And so we, we are actually, I mean, this is such a, my, it was my sister's birthday. We were going to Disneyland 
and we were like, maybe it's eczema. Like we couldn't tell at first. Oh, no. And I was like, I don't know what this is. Oh. And um, so, but we're taking my sister to Disneyland and I, and you know, we, we sat down and we were like, okay, we gotta, Alex has got to go to the doctor because he probably shouldn't go to Disneyland if we don't know what he's got. And so we, we go to Disneyland. Alex is supposed to meet up with us <laughs> and he, we send him off to the, it's like a little mini kind of like a minute clinic. And sure enough, the doctor's like, Oh no, no, you've got hand, foot and mouth and it's about to <laughs> explode. Oh, you cannot and will not go into Disneyland. Right. So we That's had to right. get our tickets. We had, they refund, they gave us our tickets back. Like yeah. they refunded us our tickets and we went to Disneyland, you know, like four weeks later, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was no oh oh, oh goodness pretty. yeah not pretty but I now I know what it looks like I mean I don't think I'll miss it ever again no <laughs> oh. yeah it was it was it was a little crazy but Dr. Elisa I want to say thank you is there any I know you any little extra thing that you want to do any important message I know that you said specifically like most likely if our kids are getting sick it's it's not necessarily the coronavirus it is still in small containments around the world but just to make sure that we are, you know, watch and wait, see what goes on with your kids. Yeah. You know, I would say that the most important thing right now is to really just try to stay as calm as possible. Like I said, the, the article that I wrote, I'm going to be updating it anytime I find out any more news. If I find out that we should really be more concerned, I will post that. If we find out that there is a treatment that's been found, I will post that. So we just really want to stay abreast of the knowledge, but I would avoid as much as possible reading the, the news, news the right? News. <laughs> because it is, I mean, don't watch is, the news. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't watch. The I don't, news, I don't watch right? the news either. Honestly, no. I, I had seen little bits and pieces. And then when I saw your article, I was like, you know what? I, it, it's getting to a point where I feel like I need to know more. And I knew that you would be the person I would learn from. And so, and I felt, I feel so much more at ease knowing that you had written an article that was thorough and that I, I was like, okay, now I know the real deal because I know by watching news, I know by, by, you know, seeing it, I just, there's just so much frenzy and I knew that I wasn't getting the real deal. I just, it just kept popping up and freaking people out. I was like, this is not doing anyone any favors. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's really because I wasn't that worried about it. And then I had families, parents who were calling me kind of, kind of, you know, really freaking out. And then Peter kept sending me these news articles. I'm like, stop, Come on, stop. Peter. <laughs> news articles. Right. And, and he's, he's like, like you listen. gotta look into this. Right. So then I did like literally this, this article. I mean, I was holed up at home for three days. Cause I'm like, I got to sort through this literature because if I don't, I mean, no, no one is, is doing this. And most moms don't have time to do this, right? Most practitioners don't have time to do this. So I just, I, I said to myself, I, this is my, <laughs> yeah, this is my thing. I'm going to be a hermit. This, this is weekend. like a 15 hour article yeah, is what it took. It, because it has to be, it has to be. Um, and so yeah. I, you know, I tried to put all the information from multiple different sites in one place. But really and truly, I mean, I'm I'm serious. Don't watch the news, right? Don't. Oops, that's my phone. Sorry about that. As no I worries. say, don't watch the news. Right? I got an alert. Um, don't. <laughs> I can't even. Okay, don't watch the news. <laughs> yeah, don't, I mean, just don't. Don't really. When you feel that pull towards being really fearful and really getting into that hysteria, just stop and breathe. Take a moment away, right? And then just come back and tell yourself, I'm doing the right things for my child and for my family. I know we're eating well. I know we're getting the most sleep that we can. We are trying to minimize our stress. We're trying to keep our immune systems boosted. And that is the best I can do. And I know it's going to help, right? It will. I promise you. It will help you. And it, it's going to help in the long run, you, whether coronavirus or no. I mean, this is how we keep our, our bodies happy. This is how we keep our bodies healthy. Now, if you guys... Um, again, the link for the, the blog will be in this episode for 173. Also, Elisa's, I know you heard it in the intro, but it's healthykidshappykids.com. And Elisa, honey, where else can we find you? We got the website. Yeah. So healthykidshappykids.com is really the, the best place. That's my blog. I have a Healthy Kids, Happy Kids Facebook page. So if you search for Healthy Kids, Happy Kids or search for me, Elisa Song, you will find that page. And Instagram, I love doing Instagram. So that is Healthy Kids underscore Happy Kids. So those are the best places to, to find me and uh, keep up to date with all the articles that I write. 
Yay. I thank you so much for coming on so quickly. We just, we literally scheduled this yesterday. Yesterday. (laughs) I've had so many people reaching out to me myself and I just thought, you know what? I'm so grateful. I'm so blessed to have you, you, you as a dear, dear friend. And I was like, you know what? Let me just text her and see if I can get her on the show. So I'm so glad that this worked out. And, um, and thank you so much for, for literally being in a hole for three days and <laughs> looking over an, an endless article after article to put this blog and an article together. Oh, thanks, Marisa, for, for having me on, getting the word out, and, of course, for being an awesome friend. I can't wait to see you soon. <laughs> me too, honey. All right, see you soon. All right, bye. bye. As Elisa mentioned during the interview, there is still a lot we don't know. So we both recommend focusing on boosting your immune system. That is always a good idea. And continue to live your day-to-day life while taking everyday preventative measures. Remember to wash your hands regularly, stay away from people who are sick, and wipe down high-touch surfaces. As for immune-boosting solutions, you can check out my book, The Smart Mom's Guide to Essential Oils. I will have that link in the show notes. And that next step is I highly recommend reading Dr. Elisa Song's blog, the one that we referred to throughout the episode, because she is actively updating this blog every single day with the research and the facts. And I promise you, this is going to be one of the best pieces of content to tune into as we continue to move forward with what the virus is doing. Now, I'm going to have the blog in the show notes for episode 173. Or you can just go to her website, again, www.healthykidshappykids.com. And I just want to say thank you so much for stopping by, listening in to this episode on the Essentially You podcast. And feel free, if you are looking for more issues or more concerns around the coronavirus, reach out to Dr. Song on Facebook or Instagram and feel free to ask her questions. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Until then, stay healthy, stay happy, and just have an amazing week.